obviously you guys had your first platinum album with Crushing, but right. uh, big picture or in addition to that, what effect do you think that had on you guys um, not working with him, not having that mentor there that had been with you since almost day one? It was different not seeing him in the studio for another project. Um, but the thing was, he's, he taught us so much that we pretty much had a mentality, we'll take it from here kind of thing. Like, thanks for all your help, but we'll take it from here. And not to even be disrespectful, like, yo, you know, you brought us this far, like, we don't need you anymore. But it's like, okay, you know, you taught us um, how to write a song, how to put a song together, um, what to do in the studio. And, you know, we know the ins and outs right now. We don't know 100% of the ins and outs, but we know enough to, um, to get us by. So he was sorely missed. But once we started hearing different sounds, um, we would turn to each other and like, well, would Curtis Blow make a song like this? Probably not, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, we went to Larry Smith at first um, to do Falling in Love. We only went to Larry Smith because we heard um, One Love by Houdini and we wanted to copy that sound. So we went to Larry Smith and he played the bass line for Fat Boys and he played the bass line for Don't You Dog Me. So we go to him, me and Buff went to him, and we couldn't come up with nothing. So in our minds, we were thinking like, he's not going to give us something good because he's working with Houdini. And they're, they're down with Russell Simmons. He's, he's working with Run DMC. They're down with Russell Simmons. He's not going to give us nothing good. So that's how we were thinking. We weren't thinking like a professional. We were thinking like he has some kind of vendetta, like he's not going to give us some, like, this is business. He's, he, he wants to put out a hit song so he can get paid too. We're not, we're, we're not thinking like that though. So we kind of scratched that and just um, went in the studio and got some, some guys nobody knew about. Um, if anybody heard Thief's theme, um, by, I forgot the artist. I mean, I forgot the producer who did it for Nas. Anyway, his father did Fallen in Love. His father produced Fallen in Love. Wow. Okay. And, yeah, exactly. And um, so that's who we got to do that kind of sound for us for um, the Crushing album. So when I heard Falling In Love, and at this time there were so many whispers in the industry about we were done, you know, our shtick had ran out. Um, we were nothing to but uh, one hit wonders. I mean, I don't know how you call us one hit wonders if we had three successful albums. So everybody was pretty much just writing us off, saying well, we can't come up with another hit. So Buff and Van Gibbs is his name. They worked on Fall in Love, and me and Mark came in there. We knocked out the vocals, and we played it for a couple of people, and they they just lost their minds. It was like, yo, yo, this is different, because you know it was different because we was talking about a, a grown subject, and the music was different. It didn't have that same drum pattern that Curtis Blow had. That do do that do that do that do that do. You know, it had a different kind of drum pattern, different kind of kick, different kind of snare to it, and people lost their minds. And our manager heard it; he loved it. You know, and that's when we got, we went back in the studio. We got Pepper um, from Salt and Pepper. Well, Mark was dating her at the time, and she did the the voices, the female voices with Buff. And um, once that came on the radio, people they lost their minds, man. People was <laughs> like, "Yo, this song is dope," <laughs> you know. Well, it's funny about the one hit wonder, which is ridiculous. But the other thing is remarkable is that you guys had done so much in only a couple of years. Like right. that never ceases to amaze me when I look at uh, artists or, you know, even in our own lives, when we just look like, man, I did all that stuff in three years. Right. So uh, at that point, and then you're, you know, about to do the disorderlies also. And it's just, it's remarkable. But I did, uh, with Big and Beautiful, before I forget, I did want to ask, because like Go For It was probably one of my favorite songs on there. Because it, right. it was more of the believe in yourself, positive message, uplifting type of thing. Yeah. So did, was that a song that you liked in particular, or you guys like really rode for? Oh, Mark wrote that song. Mark and Fresh Gordon. Okay. They did the production and the writing for that song. And they brought on the little, 
that's when everybody started using that. That fun, 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 fun. like I think Flash and the Furious Five used it for Larry Love. People started using that little right. whatever sound that was, and they came with that. And um, yeah, Mark wrote, wrote that song, and um, yeah, we just performed it. Okay. Um, our manager, I mean, he looked at some of these songs like I'm not, I'm not even gonna put this out stuff out as a single. This is just fillers for the album, you know what I'm saying? Like, I need something I could put out, you know? And we weren't into sitting down and just writing a song that we think could get on the radio. We weren't into that. We just go in the studio and just do with songs. Um, so once again, we're naive to the business because we're not looking at anything as a hit. We think anything we, we do in the studio is a hit. Like, yo, this is going to be a big radio hit. But the company is looking at it like, no, that's not going to be a hit. You know what I'm saying? Like, we need a hit. You know, um, well, even Double O Fat Boys, we did Double O Fat Boys. It was like, uh, you know, we didn't write that. I don't know who wrote that song. Well, I was always but, uh, like, man, they're dealing with Russian spies. And yeah. I was like, what, yeah. Is this? what is this? And LL one, LL one day said, yo, let me do that song over. I'm like, that? <laughs> you want to do that over? I have fun, you know, you have it. But um But speaking to the hits, the uh innocence I think still shines with the human beatbox part three because that one to me took me back to before even the Fat Boys album where it seemed like that was like still had that vibe of this is from a show or whatever. Right. You know? So right. at that point you guys still had that mentality. Why you know, why do you think it didn't register? Like, oh, we need to focus on songs like Curtis Blow was saying, or we need to do more song structure or whatever. Um, you know, everything at that time was pretty much us just, with us, it was like us running out, running around with like chickens with our heads cut off. And the only person who was pretty much keeping us stable was our manager. So, he was pretty much a manager don't, don't know how to write a song you know, all he knows how to do is put the song out and get it to radio so a lot of stuff we was just putting out we was just in the studio doing so many freaking songs something that would stick and he would come in and lend the ear like okay i like that one we're going to keep that one, that kind of stuff so a lot of the stuff we knew how to write a song but we didn't have that same kind of um push from a person like curtis blow that's telling us Nah, you gotta scratch that. I don't like that. Or that's not a good song for you guys. We were just pretty much just like, yo, we're on our own. Like, you know, we thought we were the shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, we're doing this now. You know, we don't need this. We don't need that. And so a lot of this stuff, Mark was was um was coming up with different kind of ideas, and they weren't sticking with our manager because they were songs that he wouldn't he he couldn't promote that he couldn't market or whatever. So, um, you know, so once we did Sex Machine, he was like, okay, we could do that. You know, we could do Sex Machine. But the less and the other stuff, we're, we're, not, we're not messing with that. Uh, Big and Beautiful, the title track. Um, I'm trying to figure, did, did we even write that? You know, I think Dave Ogren came up with the, the hook for that song. And yeah, I've heard that that one struck out to me so much. It was like, "You guys are beautiful." I was like, what? "Yeah, yeah." It's kind of yeah. I think about it now. It's like, you know, "Bad boys are beautiful." I'm like, really? Are they? You know. <laughs> so with crushing that album is your guys' uh, platinum album, and it does well, and it's on Polydor. Did you right. see, like what was the difference then of the business for you guys? Did it seem different? Did it seem platinum? Were you getting more money? Were you getting more? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, it it put us on another, another plateau because um, one thing about this industry, you can sell gold all you want, but once you hit that that million that million sales mark, you know you're you're not invited to the party. You know, people they will look they will look, they will look at you kind of differently. Different artists will look at you like. Wow, they sold a million copies. And you gotta remember, this is at a early stage of hip hop. So yeah. nobody's really selling no million copies, you know. Oh. Um, so I remember we had a party 
um, Polly grabbed through us through his party at, at um, the Hard Rock Cafe in Manhattan. And so many different rappers came to the party to celebrate the success of um, Crushing. And they were just giving us these kind of looks like, yo, these guys are on a different kind of level. Like, they sold a million copies. You can hear them whispering. Yo, I heard they sold a million copies. Yeah, I heard it was two million. I heard it was three, you know, that kind of stuff. And, but um, I think it panned out at 1.8, something like that. And everybody was elated. Everybody was happy. And I mean, I mean the, the Polydor was, was doing backflips. Um, because Polydor took a chance on us, you know. Um, our manager, he was he was on another cloud. He was, you know, we got invited to the Grammys, um, the 88 Grammys. Um, met Michael Jackson that year. So it was just, it, it opened a lot of different kind of doors for us. Um, got us on own tour. Um, so we didn't, we didn't share the stage no more with Run DMC and Houdini. You know, we had our own tour. We were the headlines of our own tour. So it was, um, you know, once you start selling a million, million plus, you know, you, you, like I said, you're pretty much welcome to the party, you know. Wow. And then kind of like you used to walk around with your chest sticking out and, you know, different kind of vibe. Like, yeah, I didn't sell as much as us, that kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> Because even in 87, 88 is the real explosion of the release right. of albums. 87 is right. so, still unusual to even be putting out a rap album. And for you guys to have had at that point, whatever Big and Beautiful did, to have two actual for real gold albums, maybe a third, and now a platinum right. album in 87? Yeah. That's crazy. Well, it, it's this um, consistency of the group. Yeah. Like the first album is pl is gold. Second album is gold. Third album, you know, we don't know the actual um, sales at the end. And the fourth album is gold, um, platinum, platinum plus. And the fifth album is gold. You know, so it, it's like um, to have a stretch run like that. It's like it's it's you can it's like one out of maybe two hundred groups that could do that, or maybe one out of maybe two hundred artists that can do that. You know, nobody comes along every day and just puts out hit after hit after hit, hit album. You know, that's kind of unusual. It's very rare. And and especially in rap. Like it was, because right. uh, even, you know, Run DMC, Houdini, you guys, group wise, that was it, I think, at that point in 87. Yeah. <laughs> it was just you guys, three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I was talking to DMC one day, he said that. And he said, you realize in 84, like, the only talk in hip hop was Fat Boys, Run DMC, and Houdini. He said, for six months, that's all anybody talked about. Like, we ruled hip hop. And I never thought of it like that. Like, nobody said, I mean, nobody could come near our circle. Like, it was just us three. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty much, you know, that's pretty true, you know. Yeah, but, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And then with, um, the other level of the game is now you also have your own movie with Disorderlies. And right. The thing to me, like I love the movie, watching it when it came out and everything, but right. looking back on it, the thing that really impressed me was the Ralph Bellamy aspect of it. That <laughs> yeah. This dude has been in Rosemary's Baby, yeah. Trading Places, like iconic movies. Right. And you guys no disrespect to Crush Group, but it's like, you guys are not actors. <laughs> it's like... Right, we're not actors, exactly. And, and what's crazy is Art Carney was supposed to be in the movie instead of Ralph Bellamy. Wow. But Art Carney wanted too much money. Okay. So we had our eyes set on playing with the guy who was with Ralph Cramden, who was big honeymoon fans. So like, Art Carney's going to be in the movie. So we found out it was Ralph Bellamy, um, Buff didn't know who he was. I'm like, okay, oh, can you ever see Trading Places? I'm like, yeah. I said, well, that's the guy. So that's when Buff was like, oh, that's him? I'm like, yeah, that's him. And um, so we get on the set, and we're talking all this slang, man. We're talking slang like there's no tomorrow. Just talking. We had no idea he was sitting there behind us listening to us. So he told <laughs> He told a studio exec, are they from America? Because <laughs> he didn't know. <laughs> he was talking so much. 
slang like that's dope, man. That's fresh. And that's funky dope, man. That's deaf. He said, and I think he said, a manager said, he said, what are you guys are deaf? I said, well, oh, deaf, yeah. He said, no, he thinks one of you guys are deaf because you kept saying deaf. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was funny as hell, man. He took a liking to us. So he wrote us this long letter at the end of the movie, right? Mm-hmm. And four pages long. I wish I would have kept it. Four pages long. You couldn't understand what this man was saying. I'm like, what is this, gibberish? And he said, that's what I hear when you guys are talking. He said, I love you guys so much. <laughs> he didn't know what the hell we were saying. <laughs> but we talk so much slang around him, you know? Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.